I want to welcome everyone to the services of the Church of Christ here in Santa Paula this morning. For those that are in our audience, we thank you for your attendance. For those of you that are on the podcast, we thank you for your attendance on the podcast. We pray that everything that we say and do will be all in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Bob's lesson this morning is going to be taken from... Lights went out. No, yeah, I asked. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. Uh, John, the fourth chapter, if you would, please, uh, starting at verse four. It says, Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Bob? <laughs> Well, thank you, Kenny. If you could see, I went old school today, Bible class, and today this is my PowerPoint, the cross and this little jar of water from Jacob's well in Israel. Okay, so this is my prop, okay? It actually says it on there, Jacob's well. So if you notice, Jacob's well was read in the reading, right? Jacob's well. Do you realize that Jacob's well is about as far away from Santa Paula as you could possibly imagine? So just in case you can't imagine how far Jacob Well is from Santa Paula, let me help you. Imagine boarding Al All Airlines from LAX, um, traveling nonstop to Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel, then exiting the plane, not leaving your keys in the plane, which I did, Okay, thank God I have those little buzzer things that tells me where my plane was at Ben Gurion Airport. So not leaving your keys in the plane and immediately exiting the plane and boarding a taxi or Uber driver. About two hours later, driving through Israel, maybe 100 miles from Tel Aviv, you'll end up at Jacob's Well. That's 7,540 miles from Santa Paula or 24 hours. So can you imagine, it's a long trip, but you could be there today. And I wanted to say that because places we read stuff in the Bible and we think, well, this doesn't exist. That's a fairy tale. Well, it's there. It, it is there today. So, <clears throat> Nablus, which is today the name of the city of Samaria. If you didn't know that, they changed it to Nablus. It's modern day city of Nablus. In the Old Testament, it was called Shechem. If you read Genesis 33 about Jacob's well, they don't call it Samaria, they call it Shechem. So Nablus, Samaria, and Shechem is the city, okay? Well, it was there that my family and I, some members of our church, one, two, three, raise up your hand if you went with me. Okay, there was a few of us here, Fred too. Uh, members of our church are some tourists that were there buying these little jars of water from Jacob's well. And it was exciting. I remember we were excited to buy them, even though it was just water, okay? Um, but more importantly than those jars of water was Jesus' claim at the well. Amen? Jesus' claim at the well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, uh, I'm going to go Nat Geo here, a little bit of archaeological history. And I just thought this was just interesting to me. When we went, we were giving, giving these little guides and booklets about archaeology. So every place we went to, we read some stuff about what was Jacob's well like and what's the archaeological facts behind it. Well, here's some interesting facts. The site known as Jacob's well today is about a 100-yard football field away from Tel Balata. And a Tel is basically just a hill site where over the years, mounds have grown over where the city was, and then they excavate it, take off all the dirt, and you'll find a city. It's called Tel Balata. Well, that is, um, Tel Balata is actually Sikar. Remember, Kenny had mentioned that's in the reading, Sikar. 
And it says there that Jesus traveled, so he came to a town in Samaria in verse 5 called Sychar. Well, that's Tel Balata. Well, 100 yards away from it is the church where Jacob's well is, okay? So, as early as 330, and it says CE, but I like AD. I like Anno Domini. I don't know why I like that. Maybe because of Ben-Hur back in the day. And the year of Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, that's what it means. As early as 330 AD, this site has been associated with the episode in Jesus' ministry where he met the woman at the well. The well is 135 feet deep. It's a very deep well, and it even says it in the text. You'll see that as we come to our reading. It's very deep. And below the church of the Bur Yaqub Monastery, where today priests continue to host guests from all over the globe, they still sell these small jars of water from the well. And here is proof. I was mentioning this to Liz yesterday, not knowing that she had bought one of these, and they buy these, and it was three years ago, so there's no water left. It all evaporated, so I can't drink from the well. Darn. Anyways, Christy said she has one, too, at her house, but these are the little small jars of water from Jacob's well. So you see that, Jacob's well. Well, I guess what I wanted to share with you today as I was reading the story of Jacob's well and giving you some of these facts and background. It kind of got me excited to think about this place actually exists. And when you read the story of the Gospels, Jesus comes in and he challenges some institutions. In chapter 2, he talks about the institution of a wedding. And he didn't really challenge that, but it was at a wedding, which is a modern day institution in Israel and today, that's very important that Jesus revealed his first miracle. He changed water to wine. Then in chapter 6, he deals with the Passover, or chapter 3, he talks about rabbi, the teaching. Remember, Nicodemus comes to him in chapter 3. And what Jesus actually is challenging the institution of, I guess, the preachers of the day, he was telling him, you don't need a new teaching or a new teacher. What you need is a new heart. Be born from above. Amen? That's what we need. We don't need a new teaching. We don't need a great sermon. What we need, we come to church, what? To change, challenge our hearts. So if you're here this morning and your heart is hard or there's something going on, you're discouraged, change it. Challenge yourself to be better because that's what Jesus wants. That's what he was talking about, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, to a degree, didn't understand that Jesus was challenging him. You need to follow me. There's plenty of other institutions that he challenged. He challenged the Passover. And in today's story, he challenges a sacred well, the monument where Jacob's well was. And if you go to Israel today, they have all these national churches and these national, I guess, parks, they call them. And they build big churches over them and monasteries. And they go there and they really, I guess, uh, not that they worship them, but they're monuments. And sometimes we set up our religion like a monument. So here's what's at stake. People don't need another new monument. We don't need another one to go there and put flowers down or another new teaching or a great sermon. What we need is a new quality of life. This is the story today. A new quality of life infused with God's eternal love. Amen? Amen. We need a new quality of life. And I think about that. Quality of life is important. Amen? And that's why it's a struggle. We have to continue to be sanctified. So that's the intro to this. I know it's a lot. I thank Liz for uh, doing this little picture in front. You see a woman at the well and she has a bucket. And there's a picture inside that's pretty neat. So let's go back to the story and revisit the story. Um, John chapter 6 or 4, I'm going to read from 6b. It's interesting that it says, and it was about noon, right? Does it say that in there? It was about noon or the sixth hour. So it's about noon. And a lot of people say, well, it, it's about noon is to contrast that this person would come out, a woman, because she wasn't accepted in society. But the real contrast is between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Nicodemus came at night, and she came in the light of the day. And that's where Jesus was revealed to her as the Messiah. So think about the contrast between night and, uh, I guess, night and day. So it was about noon in the light of day. When the sun's the brightest, it says in verse 7 that a Samaritan, and then it even brings it up, woman. And I thought it was interesting. Of all the gospel stories, this woman needed to be named. 
We don't have a name for her. But it's called the Samaritan woman. We read all titles. The Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? And that was brought up in the Bible study the other night. Just a simple question. You're out in the street. You go to Vons. You may start off a conversation with someone, something just as simple as this. Will you give me a drink? And Jesus is always intentional, right? So maybe sometimes we need to be a little more intentional with our conversations. If the Holy Spirit prompts you, say, hey, I want to really pray and maybe plant the seed to someone that I may see. Think about it. Think of this story. So Jesus was intentional. Um, I thought it was interesting. Look at verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. He didn't have to go through Samaria. He could have went down to the Jordan River, up the Jordan River to Galilee, which is the way we went because we didn't want to be, go through all those checkpoints. Remember that? We got on the bus and went the long way. But Jesus had to go to Samaria. He was intentional about it. He went out of his way, not only to go to Samaria, but to stop at a monumental location where Jacob's well was. If you want to read about that, it's in Genesis 31 or 33, verses 18 through 20. Jacob bought a plot of ground, and he gave that ground to his son, Joseph. So he had to go through Samaria. He came to that town called Sychar. And so he was at that plot of ground where Jacob, and all this history is brought up in this little text. And so when the Samaritan woman came to him, so Samaritan woman came to him draw, uh, to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And then it's an interesting little footnote. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So it's just Jesus by himself with this lady. And it, here's where the story creates some tension. You start seeing some things in there that kind of stirs your blood, hopefully. Maybe stirred her blood. Jesus says to her, verse 7b again, will you give me a drink? And the woman responded, I thought it was interesting. You are a Jew. I thought, how did you know that? So what is he was wearing? Because Samaritans, we mentioned this in the Bible study, were Jews too. Remember Jacob's well? Our father Jacob, she says. So Samaritans had the history of being Israelites too. So what was the difference? How could you tell? The Samaritan said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? I thought it was interesting, that st statement. I put in my notes here, knowing the cultural customs of the day, knowing who she was, and knowing in a sense that Jesus was a Jew, my way of thinking about it is, I would have said it this way. This is Bob Perez, Perez's version of her statement. You are a Jew, and you're asking me, a Samaritan woman, or drink? I would have put, do you seriously expect me to give you a drink when you know that the kosher laws inhibit me from sharing utensils with you? Do you realize if she got her bucket or her cup and gave it to Jesus because of the kosher laws, she would either contaminate Jesus or vice versa. And the reason why I said that, if you look down in your reading there, in verse 9, there's a little parenthesis, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Does, who has that in there? Do you see that in your Bible? Mm -hmm. But mine has a little footnote, letter C. And I read that. And letter C says this, not that Jews don't, uh, for Jews don't associate with Samaritans. It says, for Jews do not use dishes Samaritans have used. Interesting. Those are, if you buy, look at the early manuscripts, there are two translations there. And that makes sense. Cleanliness. But here's what the Messiah does. He ignores it. He ignores what goes on in our cancel culture world today. He just ignores that statement. Jews do not associate with Samaritans, and I'm a woman. This intersectionality that goes on in the world, and he played the victim. He completely ignored it. And what did he do? He did the basic pattern 
that John wants to show us all. Jesus is beginning to make a claim for himself, and he wants to see the response. And the response is, when Jesus makes a claim, people either misunderstand or, be, or get angry. And this is the first story, really, of revealing Jesus besides Nicodemus in chapter 3. And you could tell it's clear what comes out of this. So let me just read it. You are a Samaritan, verse 9. The Samaritan said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, because maybe kosher laws, or maybe just, she just knew we just don't get along. We don't racially mix, whatever it is. And Jesus ignores that and says, Jesus answered her. And I think this is important for us. If you are a Christian, and we know the gift that God has given us, why don't we evangelize more? That's really what it says to me. If we know this, why don't we do that? If you knew the gift of God, and we do know the gift of God, amen? Those of us in the church, don't you know the gift of God? He has given us eternal life. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that has saved your life, of course, I'm sharing it my own way. It doesn't mean to bang someone over the head with the Bible. It just means to pray and to be intentional and think about how Jesus is, and we need to be part of that kingdom, amen? If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So as mentioned, the basic pattern, Jesus is getting ready to make a claim here, and he's setting it up. Jesus makes a claim, and the people respond with misunderstanding. So Jesus gets her attention, or he got her attention. The response in verse 11 through 12 of the Samaritan woman can be summed up in five words. You don't have a bucket. So it's clear that she misunderstood. Amen? You don't have a bucket. And the well is deep. Let me read it. Sir... The woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. How deep is it? Do you remember? 135 feet deep. It is a deep well. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Knows what she does. She refers back to a common ancestor of Jews and Samaritans, that the common ancestor is Jacob the son or the grandson of Abraham. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock? And then here comes the claim. As stated earlier, it was there that I, along with my family, were buying those small jars of water. But more importantly than these jars of water was Jesus' claim about the water. Right? And here's the claim. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. I don't know about you, that catches my attention. Jesus is doing something here in Scripture that's called the redemptive analogy. will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them, I thought this was an interesting metaphor. The water I give them will become in them a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. So if you think about that metaphor, and if Jesus' words are true, and you're receptive to hearing God's message, that inside you right now is stirring up a spring welling up to eternal life if you're receptive to that. Amen? <clears throat> For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. That's in 526. Jesus is life-giving. Amen? Amen?
I'll just quote this one. This is one of my favorites. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Think about what Jesus is saying. He wants your life to have a quality that's beyond the way we live day to day. How about in chapter 11? I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And we're all going to die, right? One day. But because we believe in Jesus and what he did in the cross, we get to live forever. And look what he tells Mary here, or Martha. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he challenges her, do you believe this? It reminded me when I baptized someone back at Pepperdine in maybe 1984. I won't say his name. And they asked him, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God before you're baptized? And he says, I think so. <laughs> I never forgot, I think so. Well, we're going to baptize. So we baptized them anyways. But I remember he said, I think so. You're not supposed to say, I think so. Do you believe? So anyways. So yes, believe. It's welling up. Amen. What's that? It was a beginning. It was a beginning. Yeah, good. That's a good start. But I never forgot that baptism. For some reason, all the ones I've been, that was the one I remembered. So I think so. And then what about this verse? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are doctrinal statements. But the reason why I picked a woman at the well, because it's in a story. So everyone, this is the claim. Who drinks the water will be thirsty again, this water. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And I'm going to give you one more verse that's my favorite in John about this. In John chapter 7, verse 37, it was the last and greatest day of the festival of tabernacles, representing the wilderness experience. And Jesus gets up, probably in Jerusalem, by the beautiful gate, says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So, people don't need a new teaching or a new sermon, or a great teacher, what we need is a new quality of life. Amen? Infused with God's eternal love. Let's not go back to business as usual as you walk out of this church this morning. You have a quality of life that Jesus offers, and he gives it to us. Amen? That's, that's a beautiful teaching. So, what, what would your response be to that? What is your response? Let me unpack it with three statements and give me my last response, okay, in a form of a little story. People need more than just another sacred institution. A well, a church over it, selling jars of water. We need more than that, amen? We need Jesus. <laughs> People need a new quality of life infused with God's eternal love. And here's the part I wanted to share with you. And I want to say it in a little story. My, I grew up in a family where, um, and I, I don't want to cry saying this, my mom or my aunt and uncle were mentally challenged and crippled. And I grew up as a kid with my mom. We would go, I was, I was this older boy, so I was the strong group my brother, and we'd have to take Koki, which is my uncle Koki, my, my, my sister's boyfriend used to call him Uncle Pepsi, because it sounded like Coke, anyways, so Uncle Koki, Pepsi, anyway, so we would have to pick them up, put them in their wheelchairs, and take them out, and I remember we used to take them out, and uh, put them in their wheelchairs, they wouldn't talk much, especially Angie, Angie was the younger one, and she was the one that was mentally challenged, and she would not talk, unless you had food in front of her. And she would say one word in English, gimme. <laughs> and if you got too close to her, close to her, she would say in Spanish, ate, which means hasta pa allá, get away from me. And if you got too close to her, she would pull your hair. Sorry, that was a family, I remember that. So I wanted to say, I shared that little story is, be humble enough to say, gimme. Give me this water. 
That's what the woman at the well did. In verse 15, you know, she says that, and I'm just going to read it in her words. The woman said to him, sir, give me. Give me this one. May you keep your heart soft like the woman at the well. And little did she know that she met the Savior of the world right at the Wake Jacob's well. What a beautiful day in her life. Amen? Make this a beautiful day in your life as we stand and sing a song of invitation. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.